Oh yeah, so he's, she's prompting us. All right, good morning, everyone. How is everyone going this morning? Beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, everyone's beautiful. <laughs> All good. Very good. Okay, so thank you for actually for having me today. So I have been summoned by Nata to do this. So as a, um, hang on one second. So I have been summoned to give you guys an overview of the must knows and the must do's when it comes to perioperative care. So I've been in theater for how long? I don't know, since my graduation in my college years, 1996. <laughs> I've been in theater in the Philippines for 10 years nearly, and then it's nearly nine years, 10 years here in Australia. So there's a big difference really, but the principle behind it is basically the same. Okay, so um, there is a more detailed discussion of this concept when you take the OSCE preparation with us. So I know Kent is being, is, is, are you with us Kent? Have you enrolled? <laughs> We'll be expecting you. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Where in um, Sydney? Sydney. You're going to Sydney. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there, as I've said, there's a detailed discussion on this concept with the OSCE preparation classes. There's also an outline of this concept in the OSCE handbook, which you will be given as soon as you enroll with us. For the NCLEX preparation, the concept has been incorporated in medical surgical nursing topics. Okay, all right. So let's begin. What comes to mind when you encounter the word perioperative care? Give me one or just two words, one, two words. If this is mentioned, what comes to mind? Airway management. Airway management, yes. What else? You would say what? Anesthetics. Anesthetics, sure. <laughs> Perioperative. We'll start with pre-op checklist. <laughs> That's right. Yes, because the patient is a... Who do you think? This is not just any patient who comes into ED or who's being admitted into the ward or who's just walking in. This is uh, particularly a specific case patient. And who do you think this is? This is a patient who would be requiring surgery, isn't it? So we talk about perioperative care. We're talking about a surgical patient. We're talking about providing safety to a surgical patient. We're talking about the operating room, as mentioned, preoperative care, we've got intraoperative care, and we've got postoperative care later on. And so patient will undergo anesthesia. And so all of these concepts are brought together through this major concept on perioperative care. Okay. So the term perioperative refers to the period of time between the preparation for an anesthetic, then you've got the surgery, and then recovery from the interventions. This definition has been given by ACORN, which stands for Australian College of Operating Room Nurses in 2016. <clears throat> Osborne in um, 2015 has provided us with this diagram outlining the perioperative patient journey. So as you can see, the perioperative period would begin as early as the pre-hospital period. So it will start in the home and then pre-hospital when the patient is informed of the need for surgery at the doctor's office. So in Australia, that would be the GP clinics. Then the patient is referred to a specialist, which would be your surgeon. And so you, this patient will undergo assessment by the surgeon who could be a general surgeon or a gynecologist or an ENT surgeon or an orthopedic among others. And then they need to have an anesthetic for the surgery. And so they would be going to a pre-admission clinic for an anesthetic consult. This will then include the period and continue on. After that, that will continue on to the period of hospital management. So on the day of the surgery, they'll be admitted either for day surgery or of or an overnight stay, okay? If they come to ED, still 
they will undergo admission in ED before, and then they will be prepared in ED before they come to the operating room. If they're already admitted in the hospital, the preparation will be in the ward, then they will be transported to the operating room. Still, that will fall under admission, okay? So from there, they'll be prepared in the operating room in the pre-operative holding bay. There will be several checks because we, as we all know, it's all about patient safety. The checks, some patients will be annoyed, but they have to understand that this is very critical because we want to make sure that the patient is safe, okay? After all those checks, the patient is brought to an anesthetic bay where an initiation of the anesthesia will be done. After this, then the patient is brought to the operating room where the surgical procedure is done. After the operation, they will wake up from the anesthetic or they will recover from any form of anesthetic at the PACU unit, or that would be your post-anesthetic care unit. Once they have met the criteria for discharge from the PACU unit, they will proceed to stage two uh, recovery, which could be the day surgery area or back to the ward if hospital admission is necessary. Okay, but the post operative post operative care doesn't end there. The journey extends and continues through the period of home recovery and rehabilitation. Rehabilitation in the community until the patient resumes his or her usual activities. Okay, so this is the perioperative patient journey, the surgical experience of a surgical patient. So where do we come in? Where does the nurse come in? Okay. In all stages. In all, exactly, <laughs> in all stages. That is why we have to know what are those stages, what are those phases, and what would be our roles, okay? So if we go back to Osborne's diagram of an arrow where you've got four circles there with the journey, we can as well summarize that through uh, three phases. That is, you've got the preoperative phase, the intraoperative phase, and the postoperative phase, okay? So the preoperative phase, it actually begins when? So this will start when? As we said, the patient's journey would start pre-hospital admission, which could even be at home. <coughs> pre-op could start at home, MJ, isn't it? Yes, yes. And when do we say this is the pre-op phase? This is the start of, of it all. So it will always start when the patient is informed of the need of the surgery and they make a decision to undergo the procedure. So when they sign that consent form, when they agree to the uh, procedure, that's the start of our preoperative phase. And that will end when? When the patient is transferred to the OR. So as you, if you imagine that phase, it's actually either a short phase or a long phase, isn't it? If it's an, we, we can say there are two types of surgeries. You've got an elective surgery and you've got your emergency surgeries. When we say it's an elective, that means to say there is adequate time for preparation and the surgery can be delayed and will not be life threatening, which will not be life threatening to the patients. So if we go to deeper details, they will categorize elective surgeries. So they would say, oh, you're a category one. So I mean to say, you need to have your surgery within 30 days. So the surgery is required, but it can be delayed in a month's time. So for example, a hernia. Patient will have painful, an inguinal hernia. So they will have pain in their groins. But can they live with that? Yes, they can. Do they need the operation? Yes, they do. Or else the patient may complicate to an incarcerated hernia, for example. But then again, it uh, can be delayed in a month's time, but not more than that. And so they're categorized as category one. So the category two elective case is semi-urgent because they can be delayed in 90 days. So three months, okay? 
So for example, patient has a, um, let's just say a breast mass. And that breast mass is slowly growing, very slow, has been there for nearly two years. Do they need the surgery? Yes, they do. Because this lesion can convert into a cancerous lesion, right? But then they wouldn't die without the surgery in three months time, okay? So um, <clears throat> again, this is category two and category threes are elective cases that can be delayed in a year's time, 365 days, okay? So cosmetic surgeries, for example, are considered category three cases. Your vasectomy are category three cases. Circumcisions are category three cases, okay? All right, so if they are categorized, then that elective phase, the, the preoperative phase of this elective surgery can be very lengthy, okay? But compared to an emergency surgery where they need the surgery in 24 hours, or even so, we will categorize emergency surgeries as E1 to E6, where E1, they need the surgery in two hours or they need it immediately. Then the preoperative phase, we won't even know that it, it was there. Even the patient won't even feel that the pre-op phase has, has, uh, has occurred, okay? So the nurse in that pre-op phase on an emergency surgery should then be very specific, very precise, and um, very quick with that preparation. So that brings us to um, what are the nursing activities during the pre-op phase then? So the, this would include physical preparations. So that means the patient will undergo several diagnostic studies. They may even have medical regimens or preparations like a bowel prep, for instance. And you will have your pre-operative assessment and interview of the patient. So, Nursing activities are also directed toward patient support, which includes your psychological preparations <coughs> and health teachings, okay? <coughs> Other preparations of the procedure would include like, you need to have a skin prep for the knee. If in case this is a knee operation, like a knee replacement, we have to do a skin prep on the, on the knee. If it's a cesarean, for example, we need to do an abdominal preparation for, for this, okay? All right. So let's go to the next phase. The next phase is the intraoperative phase. So when does this begin? Begins when the patient is transferred to the operating room, and then it ends when the patient is transferred to the PACU or your post-anesthetic care unit, or in other, another area, where immediate post-surgical recovery care is given. And where do you think is this? If it's not in the PACU, where can they recover from the anesthetic? Of course, not in the ward. They don't go back to the ward. Ward nurses would not, won't accept this patient because they don't have the skill to take care of an anesthetized patient. So where else? So for example, it's a VRE patient. We don't want this VRE patient to be transferring from the theater to another area. So the theater itself can be used for the patient to recover from the anesthetic. So the recovery room nurse will have to go to theater. They have to put on their PPE and recover the patient there. This is to minimize transport of infectious patients. But still the principle is there. You're, the patient is recovering from the anesthetic, okay? <clears throat> So during the intra-off phase, the patient is monitored, anesthetized, their prep, their drape procedure is performed. So the nursing activity is centered on patient safety intraoperatively. It talks about um, infection control, asepsis is controlled intraoperatively. Then we facilitate the procedure itself. Nurses make sure that there is satisfactory physiologic response to anesthesia and surgical intervention intraoperatively. Okay, so after the operation, after the anesthesia, we proceed to the postoperative phase. The postoperative phase begins when the patient is transferred to recovery unit, 
or as we said, can still be in the theater, but they are already on that phase where the operation that the anesthetic is finished and ends where, as we mentioned, it will extend beyond hospital. It will um, include postal follow-ups as well as community services until the resolution of the surgical sequel happens. So the postal period may either be brief or it's very extensive. And as we said, it commonly ends outside of the hospital facility where the surgery was performed. So we will divide our post-operative phase in two more phases. You've got the immediate post-op, which is stage one. And in stage one, we make sure that the patient's physiological systems are satisfactory. Then they go to the next phase, which is stage two, which can be your day surgery, or they are transferred to the ward. Okay, so the nursing activities during the post of phase would not only be limited to making sure that the patient meets physiologic criteria, but it would also include very, very important, especially if it's a day surgery patient, health teachings, okay? So the perioperative nurse can take care of this patient all throughout the three phases if it's a day surgery case or an outpatient, uh, it's an outpatient surgery, all right? <clears throat> but um, so because we have limit time, limited time in our discussion today, I will limit my discussion on preoperative nursing care. There will be more discussions in videos if you're in our OSCE preparations. And also there's an outline in the handbook on preoperative and postoperative nursing care. Okay, all right. So, but before I proceed to pre-op care, I'd like to give you an um, overview on how perioperative nursing occurs in, in how, how we practice it in Australia. Because perioperative nursing in Australia is a specialist area. Its scope of practice is more specifically defined than that of the general nurses as a whole. So the RNs seeking to be a specialist nurse, like a perioperative nurse, they are required to undergo post postgraduate certificates. So the postgraduate certificates has specializations in either technical skills of the circulating instrument nurse role or an anesthetic recovery uh, nursing, which I have, or you can have a postgraduate certificate on uh, specializing on pain management or on critical nursing. And ACORN, is the professional national organization, which represents the professional interests of nurses, of the perioperative nurses, who works in a range of roles. So the perioperative nurse can be an anesthetic nurse, can be the instrument circulating nurse, or the PACU nurse, or pre-admission nurses, or the day surgery admission nurses, or they can be day surgery, or they can be acute pain nurses, or they can get a master's degree and um, become a pair of nurse surgeon's assistant. This is the one that pays more because they're paid as an assistant to the surgeon. Then we've got perioperative <coughs> educators and perioperative researchers, okay? So as perioperative nurses in Australia, we work to provide the level of care that is expected by consumers. And how do we know that that's the one? Because this is provided for in our standards. So the National Safety and Quality Health Services standards, NSQHS standards, is something that you really have to understand if you wanna work in Australia as a nurse, because your practice should revolve around these standards. And they are there to tell us that our practice is safe. We also abide with the best practice provided by evidence, which is published by the ACORN. And this is the Bible of um, perioperative nurses here. Since also we work closely, not only with surgeons, but with um, anesthetists, we are also provided with guidelines, professional documents and statements by ANSCA, which is the Australian and New Zealand College of Anesthetists. 
So these guidelines um, provide statements for patient care for those undergoing anesthesia for surgical or any other reasons. Okay, so if you want to become a perioperative nurse, this is these are the ones that you have to be familiar with. All right, so, but providing preoperative care will not only be limited to perioperative nurses. This can be performed by general nurses. Okay, and you aspiring to work in Australia should acquire this skill. Okay, so that is uh, that would be our <coughs> main focus for today's discussion. But before we go into specific details, let me ask this question. If you were the nurse, a general nurse, and you have a 25 year, you have two patients, both 25 years old, young patients, both fit and well, we will say fit and well because based on our history taking, they say they don't have any comorbidities at all. They exercise, they have, a, they have a good diet, they eat well, they don't have maintenance medications, or if they have, then it's just vitamins. They drink protein shakes. You know, fit and well patient is someone which doesn't have any comorbidities at all. But one patient is 70 kilos, the other one is 100 kilo. They will undergo the same procedure, a hernia repair would you be making the same care plan preoperatively for these two patients? What do you think? A yes or a no? Five seconds to press the button. Who pressed green? Who pressed the red? Because the our, <laughs> yes, our answer is no, okay? <coughs> These two patients, even if they are the same age, even if we say they're both fit and well, they are different because every patient is different. In this case, how are they different? The other one has a bigger weight, isn't it? A hundred kilo patient. Can you imagine a hundred kilo patient? So this hundred kilo patient who thinks he's fit and well would have fats, a, a deposited all throughout his body, or they may also be muscular, but the muscles and the muscles contributing to the weight, but we cannot um, say that they don't have fats anywhere, okay? So the 100 kilo patient is a bariatric patient. So when do we say it's bariatric? If there are 95 or more kilos, okay? All right, so every patient is different. And so our care plan would also be different. In this case, who do you think is a high risk patient of the two? The heavier patient. Of course, the heavier patient, the bariatric patient. Bariatric patients will never have a straightforward surgery. Why? Several reasons. There are many factors to be considered in preparing them for surgery. Firstly, as the pre-op care nurse, you would think, ops, this patient, do you think they will use the same instruments in the operating room for this patient? Of course not, because they will have a bigger diameter, uh, <coughs> a wider subcutaneous fat, and so they would need longer surgical tools. The bed, they won't fit on the narrow bed in the operating room. If they are wide, sometimes they are short and wide, like a little teapot, <laughs> they need bed extensions, okay? And we need hover mats for transfer. Have you seen a hover mat? It's like a hovercraft. So it's like a, an inflatable bed. So they need to be in this bed. So hang on, you've got the operating table, you have a deflated hover mat, then you've got the bed linen and that's where they lie down because when we transfer them from the operating bed to the to their ward beds this hover mat can be inflated and they would feel that they're floating and then you just slide them push them across okay so this is another preparation to be done in the inside the operating room 
which pre or patient uh, nurses have to communicate. And, and what else? Bariatric patients would always require, as we've said already, longer surgical tools, longer instruments, and there's always a possibility for an open procedure. If this patient is for a laparoscopic procedure, there are always chances that there's so much fat inside the viscera that it's difficult to maneuver around. They would opt for an open procedure. And you know, when it's an open procedure, that means to say longer time in the operating room because we need to close by layers and high risk for infection because the tissue are exposed to the environment for a longer period of time high risk for anesthetic complications because again, it's extensive, it's major. And if it's an open procedure, there's also a risk for blood loss, very extensive blood loss, okay? <coughs> All right. Secondly, we talked about not being straightforward when it comes to the surgical procedure. Number two, they're not straightforward for anesthesia. Uh, anesthesia. And what do you think is the most important evaluation that you have to do to this client prior to anesthetic? I'm not sure, Mom Jay, but I think it's the airway. It's always airways. Very good. Ex exactly. So it's always the airway evaluation, which is extremely important for all patients, but especially for these bariatric patients. Why is it difficult? in their airways if they're a hundred kilo patients. It's the what? It's the intubation of these patients, their chest, their neck, there's fat in there, and this would suggest difficulties in intubation. So there are specifics to that, like you know, the the, the how many finger breaths from the chin down to the chest. There are so many evaluations for that one, but generally it's because of the fat. So they cannot extend their neck that far for intubation to occur. Secondly, arterial venous access is also very dif difficult for bariatric patients. We might need even an ultrasound machine just to locate their veins for access. And systemically, there's a whole lot of it, okay? For example, the hearts. The hearts would be compromised because they have higher blood volumes compared to a 70 kilo patient. <coughs> their lungs. Their lungs would also be compromised because of ventilation issues and so on and so forth. So in other words, the pre-op nurse who looked into these two patients, very similar characteristics, but the weight differs. This way, a patient who have a higher weight is a higher risk patient will require more and extensive assessment. And this has to be uh, communicated to the next phase. Okay, all right. So ask the nurse in the pre-op care, what then would be your role? As we've already mentioned, you need thorough pre-op patient assessments, especially for very high risk patients. Okay, and it all boils down to what? It all boils down to looking at completing the assessment and you have a tool that you can use to accomplish this. And that would be your pre-operative checklist. And every hospital will have its own checklist. If you enroll with us in OSCE during your OSCE preparation, we also have a NATA um, designed pre-operative checklist and you will have a chance to uh, practice on this and we will be correcting you on how you um, accomplish this checklist and how you interview patients for you to finish this, to, to fill up the checklist, okay? So in other words, there's nothing, it, it's not a very difficult task to do because all your assessment can be found in this checklist, okay? <clears throat> so we want to make sure that the patient is medically fit for surgery and for anesthesia, and if there are risks, this can be minimized as a result of your correct preparation, okay? So let's look closely into this checklist. And as you can see here, you should have patient identification, which can be seen in a label. 
And then you make sure that it's dated and you make sure where are you admitting? Are you the admitting ward or are you in day surgery admission or are you in ward two, for example, or are you from EG? Okay, so you have to complete this thoroughly because it's the only way to identify risks. Okay, so on the first line there, you will have your weight and height, which is very important because we want to know BMIs. Anesthetic uh, drugs like your popofol, they will be infused continuously during the operation and they are based on the BMI, okay? You have to look into temperature, blood pressure, your vital signs, your observation, they will all be baseline prior to the operation. All right, another important thing would be allergies. Always, always, all the time. Sometimes this is already uh, filled up, but you still have to confirm this with your patients. And if you don't confirm this with the patient, they won't say otherwise. For example, I have a, an experience when we had to put a pacemaker on this patient and this particular surgeon do, does a venogram. So he wants dye to be injected IV intraoperatively, unlike other surgeons. So that means to say behind your mind, ops, this is under Dr. Rudd, for example, and he does a venogram. We have to make sure that the patient's not allergic to the contrast, okay? So written in the patient's notes, she, this patient was allergic to shellfish. Then we confirm patient, what are your allergies? Patient would say, I'm allergic to crustaceans. I'm allergic to shellfish. But don't be satisfied with that. You have to go deeper. We have to ask, have you ever been in, uh, have you ever had a contrast before? And so they would say, um, what do you mean by this? So without you asking these questions, you won't be able to really check if they have been uh, any experience to iodine contrast. So in to make the story short, this patient actually remembered that they had a CT scan with an iodine contrast before and they had difficulty breathing when they had this like, what, two years ago. So if we haven't asked for the specifics, this patient would, wouldn't have told us about these things. And what happened was we still did a pacemaker, but without a venogram. Okay, all right. So what else? Apart from the allergies, we have which you have to specify on this portion here, you also have to put in additional precautions. What are examples of additional precautions? So that would include what? That would also include your <coughs> infection control precautions. If patient has a history of MRSA, if patient had a history of VRE, CPE, C, diff, Hep B, Hep C, this should all be written there because this is a form of communication to the next phase, okay? And so they will be prepared in theta. So if it's a VRE, for example, all of the tables, all or everything, the, the operating room is empty except for the anesthetic machine, the table and the instruments to be used. The rest, will have to be removed out. Gloves, they have to be removed out. So there are specific preparations there. We, we need an extra nurse to be a runner if that is the case, okay? So how did the theater nurse know this? Because the pre-op nurse was very specific and accurate and complete with the preoperative checklists by writing down all this under additional precautions, okay? Aside from that, you can also include like is there a family history of malignant hyperthermia? So malignant hyperthermia is a reaction to the anesthetic. So if you write down there's a family history here, the theater nurses, the anesthetists would really appreciate that because they would be able to remove all of the anesthetic gases out of theater before the patient even goes in there. There will be a new circuit to be used for this particular patient, a separate theater for them, a separate recovery room for them. Okay, all right, what else? You can also include here if patient has diabetes, you can also include pressure injury risk and in skin integrity of patients. If the patient has any false risk, for example, patient is immobile or 
patient has a um, visual impairment. So for instance, they would have a macular degeneration. If you write macular degeneration here, everyone would know that this patient is legally blind. They won't let the patient walk through theater, of course not, okay? All right. And another important thing is a child who comes into theater, always, always, always ask if there are any loose teeth because this tooth can be uh, misplaced during the intubation, which already happened how many twice in our theater. So a very good pre-op nurse would, would be able to uh, pick that up and write it down here because it's a red flag. The anesthetic nurse who looks into this document and sees, oops, there's a loose tooth. Okay, and then the communication is trained across different personnel and the patient would be safe for sure. All right, okay, what else do we have? Um, other alerts, which we, we've already mentioned. A patient, patient, for example, has a history of seizures. So that's an alert because everyone would be ready on seizure precautions on drugs that are that will be used in case the patient goes into a seizure. Okay, and then we've got <coughs> pre-medication orders. So for example, if a patient for cesarean, there's always a standing order for a sodium citrate. The sodium citrate is a, is a medication that lowers down the acidity of, uh, lowers down secretions and acidity of the GI. So there's less risk for an um, aspiration. <clears throat> we can also have EMLA patches, those stickers placed over hands of children. So these are local anesthetic patches for potential IV cannulocytes. Basically it's used for children or those who have needle phobias. It's amazing how people comes in and say, oh, I'm afraid of needles and they've got tattoos all over their body. But even if they're anxious, and so we have to address that, they can, you can use the EMLA on these individuals, okay? You can also put in a management plan for anticoagulants, for DVT prophylaxis, or if they're diabetics. That's something that we also have to look into because we will have to manage their diabetes pre-op intra-op and post-op. So if a patient is taking in anti-diabetic tablets, your hypoglycemic tablets, do they take it in at the day of the surgery? They don't, okay? Because we don't want their blood sugar to immediately drop, they're fasting. We don't want that to happen. What about insulin? What do we do with if they are insulin dependent? What do we do? If they're insulin dependent, we tell them pre-operatively, you have to be very specific your, with your teachings, that they don't take in their insulins, but they have to bring their insulins into theta or into the admission area. Because as soon as they are admitted, we will have, they'll be fasting, we will have to check their insulins, and we may need to give them their insulin if it's really, really very high. Okay, so these are things that, uh, we need to really look into or else the patient won't have their surgery because there's a complication. Okay, all right, what else? We've got TED stockings sizing. TEDs are your anti-embolic stockings. And in our facility, it's a standing order that all patients would require TED stockings because we don't want them to have blood clots <coughs> during the operations. So. If, um, especially if the operation is more than an hour, okay? If they are lying down for more than an hour in the operating theater, there's an increased risk for blood clot. And so those TED stockings, those calf, calf compressions are very important tools to prevent the formation of blood clots, okay? All right, so use the correct size for the correct patients. All right, but not everyone, there, if you go into specifics, there are other co um, contraindications for TED stockings. Like if the patient is allergic to the stockings, then don't insist on that, okay? If they say, oh, it gives me the last time I had rashes, then don't. Even if we know that they are at risk, they're going to have a joint replacement. They're at risk for a blood clot because the joint replacement will take three, four hours, 
but they're allergic to the material. So never mind. Tell this pre-op nurse tells the anesthetist, anesthetist will have in the back of their mind, they need to have a GVT prophylaxis chemically, not mechanically. Or they can just use the cuff compressions without the TED stockings. Okay, all right. <clears throat> we also have to look into if you are the pre-op nurse in the ward, in admission or in ED, you have to look into the medical history. You have to look into the medications they use, whether they use recreational drugs or they take, take in herbals or your vitamin E, your fish oil, they're at risk for um, bleeding during the operation. This has all to be, it's a red flag, okay? If they're taking in medication for asthma, they have to take this medication even if they are for surgery. If they are epileptic, they have to take their anticonvulsants. They should be continued. If they are hypertensive, they also have to continue their antihypertensive tablets. If they have arrhythmias, they have to take their antiarrhythmic medications, even if they are to undergo surgery. If they haven't, then you have to seek clarification from the anesthetist prior for this patient going to theta. So for example, they're asthmatic. They have a maintenance puff at home, but they did not take this. And their operation is uh, at eight o'clock. The puff was expected to be uh, given. They have to take it at around seven o'clock, but they forgot. So this patient will not go to theater unless they get the puff, okay? <clears throat> Epilepsy. If a patient has an anticonvulsant at seven o'clock, operation at eight o'clock, they have to take that at seven o'clock. Hypertensive, hypertension, antihypertensive medications again will have to be continued. So only the blood thinners has to be discontinued. There are specific guidelines for that. Blood thinners, we all know, has to be discontinued five to seven days prior to the operation because we don't want bleeding to happen. Okay. And then you also have to look into the surgical history of the patient if they have had the procedure before. <coughs> so for example, this is an abdominal hernia. And so you say, hmm, how come they had a hernia? Oh, because they had a cesarean section a month ago. So that makes sense, doesn't it? If they have any issues with previous uh, anesthetics, so for example, during, uh, during that time they had a cesarean section, they had a spinal anesthetic during the operation, but they have been vomiting all throughout, intra-op, post-op. So we call that as your post-operative nausea and vomiting. And there's a, an algorithm for that one. So the pre-op nurse tells in anesthetist, tells the anesthetic nurse, anesthetic nurse knows what to do. Anesthetic nurse hands over to PACU nurse, PACU nurse knows what to do with PONV, post-op uh, nausea and vomiting. All right, you also have to look into the immunization status. status. For example, this is a dirty wound. We should have, patients should have an anti-tetanus for this, okay? And of course, details of current problems. But apart from that, we need to look into social and lifestyle factors. For example, if this is a day case patient, they'll be going home. We should know that there's a primary caregiver for this patient. Someone has to drive them home. Someone has to stay with them for 24 hours overnight. If there's no one, then that means to say, we need to find a bed for them to be admitted in the hospital, okay? And um, you also have to look into alcohol consumption of these clients because that will affect anesthetics. Look into smoking because ventilation and um, secretions are, are will, secretions will affect the ventilation. Ventilation will be compromised during the anesthesia. You have to look into special dietary needs particularly because they'll be eating after the anesthetic. So there's only one operation where they don't eat after the surgery post-op and that's a, a laparotomy. All other cases they can eat and drink, okay? But make sure that you know what are their limits. For example, this is a Muslim or an Islam patient. So there's no pork in their diet. If it's a Jewish, then it should be kosher. If they're vegetarians, then we have to accommodate that. 
if they have celiac, it should be gluten-free diet for them. Okay, and then there should also be, if you need to refer them to allied health teams, and that's required post-op, that should already be um, addressed and prepared pre-op. For instance, this patient comes in with, with, a, uh, with a fracture. So post-op, the patient will have to have follow-ups in the fracture clinic. That should already be prepared pre-op, okay? All right, so, or patient needs post-acute care or hospital in the home or district nursing, this would already be um, prepared pre-op, okay? <clears throat> and then you would have your laboratories. So laboratory results, bloods, for example, group and hold for major cases, joint replacements, hernias, um, <coughs> laparotomies, they would require coagulation studies. They would require group and hold and cross-matching because we know that blood loss is expected in such surgeries, okay? Um, we also have to look into ECGs, especially for patients who are 40 years old and above. This is um, anesthetic requests. Or if they have previous cardiac disease, then ECGs is a very important uh, diagnostic test, okay? If patient's diabetic, make sure you get their BSLs pre-op and address whatever issue there is. So if you look into this checklist, you can tick this part here. The history would be, so you'll be under ward, okay? So history, progress notes, all of those, you've got enough labels because for pathology specimens and diagnostic tests in intra-op, they would need those labels. You've got the med chart, you've got pre-med, you've got group and hold, you've got the BSL, you've done that. You have x-rays, you make sure they're there. You've got path results. So that part there would be the pre-op nurse, okay? So another pre-op nurse would be in theater, which would be your anesthetic nurse. And that would be counter, counter checked, same thing, another check, and the theater, the anesthetic nurse will tick it off, okay? If it's incomplete, then you'll be able to see the face of the anesthetic nurse and the eyebrows rising <laughs> when you're doing the handover, if it's incomplete. All right, so moving on. The second role of the nurse is to provide adequate patient education and preparation, uh, instructions and preparations for the uh, patient. So first thing first, the consent form. So the nurse needs to confirm the identity of the patient, then look into whether the patient understood the surgical procedure or has adequate knowledge of the post-op expectations. For example, they would expect this is a lap laparoscopic procedure, but, and so they would expect what? They would expect it's a keyhole procedure and they'll wake up with band-aids on their tummy. But if it's a plus minus open, then that means a bigger cut. You need to know that the patient understands this or else when they wake up, they have a bigger cut. That would be really, <laughs> there are legal repercussions to that, okay? So just ask. Uh, what are you having done today? If they say otherwise from the consent form, then that means to say what? They have not understood their operation. They have to talk again with their surgeons. So make sure that they've signed that form and the surgeon, okay? So in Australia, there's no need to witness that form. We only need the two signatures, the patient and the surgeon. It is signed and it's dated. So in Victoria in particular, our consent forms are valid for a year, okay? So look into the dates before we um, operate on them. <clears throat> and then that consent form is also very important when we mark sites. So as soon as the consent is confirmed, the site is marked if the surgery is cited. For example, you have a knee arthroscopy, right? So the right knee has to be marked with an arrow and a signature of the medical officer who marked it. So the one who marks should be the one operating on it or an assistant to the operation, okay? And it should be what? It should be the patient's side, not the doctor's side. This one happened, doctor was facing the patient, interviewing, talking, 
And so we say, oh, okay. So we're doing a knee arthroscopy on which side? On your right knee. Then the doctor marked the left knee. Why? Because she was using her right to mark the site. So this became an issue when they, we opened up, oh, oh, why is this wrong knee? Oh, wrong marking. So, you know, the, these things happen really. And most often times, nurses are the ones who pick this up. Okay, all right, what else? We also had to look into fasting. Fasting means no food, no water. Okay, so the nurse must ensure that the dietary orders are followed. How many hours fasting? Our rule is at least six hours prior for both adults and children. Okay, the solid food is prohibited six hours before an elective surgery. Okay, what about if it's an emergency surgery and they have had food? What do we do? <coughs> we start counting, oh, uh, not well fasted, should be six hours, but patient had the fracture, it's an open fracture, the bone is coming out, had been drinking, had been had ha having dinner, met a motor vehicle accident comes to us. And so you counted, uh, had a meal two hours prior, what do we do? So there are other anesthetics, patient can undergo a spinal anesthesia otherwise, not a general anesthesia, so that the patient is awake and can protect their airways. But if they ever react to the anesthetic, then we would expect them to be vomiting. And when they vomit, they aspirate, right? And so we should already be ready with our vomit bags and patient's head turned to the side during the operation. You cannot turn the whole patient, but the head turned to the side would already limit, uh, minimize the risk for an aspiration. Or if not, what? If it really requires a GA, so for example, this is a motor vehicular accident or here in the regional area, our accidents would be, they've been trapped by a tractor, a tractor run over them, or there was one who got caught in a digger. So this is like an arm, which is already macerated and needs an amputation. What sort of anesthesia would this patient have? Of course, a GA, right? They have to go to sleep, <laughs> but then they have eaten. What do we do? Do we do a lavage? We don't do a lavage. We have to do the GA. Uh -huh. But the GA, the intubation is through a rapid sequence intubation. We call it an RSI to reduce the risk of pulmonary aspiration of the stomach acid contents. So um, this is a skill which will be learned by anesthetic nurses through the postgraduate certificates. So what they do is... Sorry, Mam Jay, what was the, what is it, RSI? RSI, a rapid sequence intubation. Okay. Yeah. So the anesthetic nurses should know how to do a cricoid maneuver or a Celix maneuver. That means to say they can, they put pressure onto the esophagus during the intubation. Okay. And the patient would require, um, it, it's a short acting muscle relaxant. So we don't wait for the muscle relaxant for a long period of time for it to work. It need, we need the short acting socks, for example, socks of methonium. <coughs> and as soon as we see circulations, we do the intubation. And um, again, it, it's a coordinated movement and synchronized with the anesthetic anesthetic nurse and the anesthetists. Okay. So there are so many times we've done this and so many times patient really didn't aspirate, even if they had had a meal. Okay. All right. But ideally it should be six hours prior. All right. Now question. What about milk? They said I had coffee, tea at six o'clock this morning. Operation is at eight o'clock. Is that all right, coffee, tea? And then they said, oh, I put milk in my coffee and tea. So do we uh, consider this a solid? I, no I would food, say, no I food, would say, yeah. yeah. I would say tea and coffee would be clear fluids. Yes, they're clear fluids, yes. But would if with the milk, would we consider it a solid? I think no. Okay, why, why do you think no? 
because there's a new guideline now that water or clear fluids can be taken not more than 200 mils up to two hours before an elective surgery. So we need to say they can have tea, coffee, but without the milk, okay? Because milk can curdle inside the stomach. And so that makes it, it that's considered solid, right? So if you ask, oh, have you had, you don't ask, have you been fasting? Of course, they would say, no, <laughs> because, you know, sometimes they just say no for everything. So you ask it in a different way. Have you had breakfast this morning? Did you have tea or coffee? Did you put milk in it? Something like that. So with that, you're able to gather more information. So tea, coffee, water allowed two hours prior, as long as it's not more than 200 mils for an elective surgery. But milk, okay, milk is considered solid. And so if they put milk into their coffee and tea, then that operation will have to be delayed because they need to have fast for six hours. Okay, all right. What about the tablets? We said they have to take their antihypertensive meds because they are hypertensives. They have to continue this. They can take that prior, but only with a sip it's of water. water. Yep. Okay, all right. Now, what about infants? For babies, you know how babies are. They're always hungry. You put a dummy onto them just so they, um, they calm down, but sometimes that dummy doesn't give them comfort anymore because they're just hungry. So we've got a guideline here. If it's breast milk, they're exclusively breastfeeding, then that is safe up to four hours. But for all other milks, again, we considered it a solid because it curdles, curdles inside the stomach. Then it has to be six hours. And the baby will just have to stay with the dummy for that six hours. All right. Again, why are we doing this? Why do they have to fast? Because we are scared that they will vomit, they'll aspirate in the, during the operation. Okay. <coughs> All right. Sorry. Okay. Next. Oh, wait. Before I proceed to that, what about chewing gums? What do you think? They've chewed the gum. Spit it out. What do we do? Do we delay the operation because they chew the gum? So they said, I spit it out. I didn't take it in. Or even lollies, you know, those, um, the, the lolly that dissolves. What do we do? So it's about the, it's not about it being spit out, but it's about the gastric acid that will be produced because of the chewing gum. And so we need to, we will consider that as um, <coughs> food. And so they have, that they have to be delayed for six hours from the time they had that chewing gum. Okay, all right. Or the lolly. <coughs> okay, so what else? There should be an ID band. All right, so hang on, going back to our checklist, if we were to fill up this checklist, we will say, yes, solids, fluids, they're separate, and so you have to ask them separately. Then next would be the ID band, yes. Two ID bands, why two? One in the wrist, one in the ankle. So why, why should it be on the ankle? Because when the patient is draped over the top and the arms are tucked in, for example, in laparoscopic surgeries, we can con still confirm the patient's identity during a timeout using the ID band over the ankle or other way around, okay? <clears throat> That's why we need the two. And then what else? These ID bands will have color coding. I don't know with other hospitals, but red would always mean patient has allergies. So everyone, it's a universal language in our facility. So as soon as we see red, oops, patient has an allergy. There's an alert for this patient, okay? And then the theater attire, patient has to remove their own clothing. They have to use the gowns, which can be the cloth gowns, which are laundried in the hospital or the disposable ones. They have to use those fancy knickers, we call them. 
These are the disposable underpants, one size fits all. And then there's the theater cap. Again, it can be color coded. So we use red caps for those who have allergies and just a normal white or blue cap for those who don't. <coughs> okay, all right. Free of baths and showers are becoming a new guideline. So in the preoperative clinic, they'll be given chlorhexidine washes and they should use this prior to the day of the surgery. Okay, if they haven't had a shower, then they can do it in the day surgery admission area. Okay, <clears throat> but if um, some facilities doesn't have them, but that's fine. As, so, as long as they have a bath, they have a shower, they're clean. Okay, and then what else? The hair is clipped, particularly the hair of the operative sites. When we say clipped, that means we're using a clipper, not a razor, because razors are a increases the risk for having cuts. And that would be a good venue for bacterial growth for post-op infections. <clears throat> and we remove the hair as close as possible to the surgery time. Again, to minimize the infection from setting in. So most often times you can even ask the surgeon or the assistant surgeon to do the clipping. Okay, what else? Jewelries, <clears throat> makeup nail polish, all have to be removed, okay? Cosmetics, deodorants, talcum powder, hairpins, they should all be removed. Why? <coughs> because they harbor microorganisms. So jewelry, wedding rings, they've been there for 30 years. They cannot take it off. What do we do? They're very tight. What do we do? Tape. Yes, we can tape this so that it doesn't get doesn't get lost, even if it's really tight, but then, you know, it's a, at least we know that it's there. However, if the ring is the same side of the surgery, so we're talking about a patient, for example, who have a carpal tunnel, who's got tingly hands, so we need to release the nerve there and has a wedding ring on that side, that wedding ring has to be cut and removed, okay? So, <clears throat> Why, why, do, why would they say, would say, why it's been there for a long time? Then we have our patient education comes in. This hand will be manipulated and we would expect it to be swollen, right? And that ring, which is tight fitting, would be constricting on that finger when that finger gets swollen. And we don't want that to happen to, to these patients. And so then they would be able to understand why, okay? All right, nail polish, nail polish, you just get your acetone, remove the nail polish with the acetone. But there are acrylic nails nowadays, right? The acrylic nails, acrylic nails, that's like for your $45 nail polish, would require the, well, what do you call that? The sanding to remove that acrylic nail. And then they would say, mm, can we just place it there, stick it there for now? And so what do you say? Yep, remove. $45 gone. Okay, so with that, again, this harbors microorganisms, okay? And let's just say preoperatively, you have 10 patients to be admitted. Here comes two patients with acrylic nails. You don't have time to send all of these acrylic nails. So what we can do is one nail is okay. Only one nail, you take off the acrylic nails and nail polish. Especially if that um, that limb or extremity is your operative hand or extremity, okay. So again, why? Because aside from it harboring microorganisms, we will be checking neurovascular orbs post-op, and we won't be able to check it if there's that nail polish. <clears throat> All right. So what else? Prosthesis, pacemaker. This all have to be. Um, so jewelry, wait, tick, tick, uh, pre-op wash, shower there. Okay, what's this? Dentures with patient and then hearing aids, prosthesis. Tick, tick, tick. That would be our next items. So prosthesis, we're talking about things that are with the patient they don't normally have, like a joint or a wire or a plate or a screw or a pacemaker, okay? This has to be 
flagged and you can itemize here what sort of prosthesis they have. <clears throat> Why is that? Because during operations, we will be using the diathermy or um, coterie. I think that you use the term coterie or bovie in other countries. So the diathermy will use electricity to either cut or coagulate the tissue so that you have a bloodless operation. But the electricity can, can get into the body, go into any organ that produces electrical stimulation. If it's the heart and you've got the pacemaker there, that will damage the pacemaker. Okay, so you need therefore a diathermy that is bipolar for patients who have pacemaker. Not bipolar, bipolar <laughs> psychiatric, but it's a bipolar because it's like a forcep, which has two ends, and so electricity is captured by the other end, other end. But if they insist on a monopolar, then the operation won't happen. So the surgeon has to be on board and use a bipolar for those who have pacemakers. For those who have prosthesis, then a monopolar will do. But we need a grounding plate. We need something where electricity exits out of the body. And that grounding plate should not be on top of the prosthesis. It should not be on top of a scar tissue or a bony prominence because it will cause burns. Okay, Or even on tattoos, particularly the red tattoos, your diathermy plate shouldn't be placed in these areas because again, it will be uh, an area, increase the risk for burns. <clears throat> what about those who have defibrillators, like your, um, <coughs> the, the defibrillators that goes with the pacemaker? What do we do with this? So the diathermic current will be interpreted by the defibrillator as a VF, a ventricular fibrillation, and this will lead to shocking the patient, right? So what we do with those who have internal defibrillators, we have to deactivate that defibrillator by using a magnet, okay? So again, the pre-op nurse who pick this up will have to document this in the pre-op checklist, and that would be our form of communication to the intraoperative nurse, then they'll be ready for this patient to minimize the risks. Okay, next, hearing aid. What do we do with the hearing aids? Hearing aids remains in situ because we'll be giving instructions to patients, take a nice deep breath before they go to sleep so that hearing aid can stay there, okay? <clears throat> dentures dentures are, can be left in place until the intubation. Okay, sometimes it's uncomfortable for the patient without the dentures, then okay, we'll leave it in place, but make sure that the intra-op nurse, the anesthetic nurse, takes this out during the intubation so it doesn't get dislodged or the patient may aspirate with this, okay? <clears throat> all right, so all of this we will document and as soon as this have all been ticked, this pre-op nurse, ward nurse, ED nurse, or admission nurse will do a handover to the anesthetic nurse. And the pre-operative check, pre checklist is completed and you will have to sign that. Anesthetic nurse who receives the patient checks again, do the same checks, same thing, same items. Then they would sign and say pre-op check, patient passed the test, we can continue on with the surgery, okay? So why do we all do these things? Why so many checks? Patient needs to understand that this is all about patient safety, okay? And safety is when you never have to say sorry. And it always starts with you, okay? So my references for this discussion today, you have got four books there. And thanks everyone for listening to me and putting up with me for the last hour. <laughs> okay, do you have any questions? Is that you? That's me, yes, doing a joint replacement. That's a knee there, see? 
that's a I had to have a photo shoot so I can place this in the slide. <laughs> so we had a joint replacement. And that one there is your femur. That's the procedures that we put in. Okay, so I'll stop share. And we still have time, Carissa, for questions. Anyone has a question? <coughs> yeah, the care for um, Namrata Gautam placed in the chat. What about care during intra and after surgery? So intra op won't be required in OSCE because it's a specialized technical area. So what we're doing here is we're trying to give in information, particularly for you to pass your OSCE. And so you can go into it in detail and get the specialization on um, circulating or perioperative nursing in particular or anesthetic if you want. But we, we won't discuss that in, in this forum. After surgery, um, I've mentioned that in the OSCE, there are videos. There will be a video on this. And also in your OSCE handbook, there's an outline there. And during the face-to-face, -face, we, if you have any more questions, then we can answer all those questions for you. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Mom Jay. I okay. learned a lot from your um, discussion today, RSI. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It, the the anesthetist will tell you that oh we need to do a rapid sequence. Are you ready? So the anesthetic nurse should be ready. So they the laryngoscope, the tube should already be there. We use a bougie or a stilet if they need they want. You should be ready with your tapes. You should be ready with a video laryngoscope in case this turns out to be a can't intubate, can't oxygenate kind of patient, or it becomes a difficult airway, a difficult intubation, you should already be ready for this uh, case, really. And um, the information on that would be very specific and technical, and so you that's a different forum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, red tattoos. It's amazing how red tattoos, they found out that red contains a lot of metals. And so that that's why you don't put the grounding plate on top of the tattoos. So find any other vascular air, vascular um, organ. So where so it's either on the thighs, back, front, side of the thigh, doesn't matter, or on the back, not on top of the spinal cord, but on the on the lats. Or if not, you can use the abdomen. Not on the breast for sure can't do that. <coughs> and take note that the diathermy plates comes in different sizes. So use the correct one for the correct size. So pediatrics will have smaller ones, baby ones, and the adult ones would have bigger, larger ones. Yeah. And I can also imagine, Mom Jay, the infants who are fasting mm. for six hours if they oh are um, formula fed. So, yeah. Yeah, you will have... As the pre-op nurse, you will not only look into assessment, but we'll have to think of ways to, to um, calm the parents calm, down, <laughs> calm the parents and calm the child. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it's it's just hard. Um, what do you call this? To see the child crying, and you'll be hearing the child. Uh, child's upset. You made her upset. You did not give her food, <laughs> but that's what we need to do. Okay, so any more questions? I think that's all, Mom Jay. Thank you okay. very much for that. And I will be very interested to watch your video for the post-operative care. So that yes. would be interesting. Thank yep. you so much. That's all right. Thank, thank you so pleasure. much. Mom. Thank you so much, Mom Jay. We learned a lot.
Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if there, are, if ever you go home and have a question, again, shout it out or place it in our student portal and we will answer and get back to you as soon as we can. Okay. All right. I'll end this meeting for everyone. I'll see you. Bye. Bye-bye.